Today, we're going to go over a lot of different things, so some preventative techniques. Uh, how do you recognize one and how do you get back uh, safely uh, after you have one? And what are some of the risk factors that we do deal with? I am the medical director of the concussion program for the professional supercross and motocross um, events, uh, working with the AMA and MX Sports. I'm one of the physicians for the Alpine Stars Mobile Medical Unit, and I've also certified as a chief medical officer of the FIM. Uh, those of you that have not seen it, this is our Alpine Stars Mobile Medical Unit, uh, uh, which goes to every professional race, all supercross races, the uh, outdoor nationals, the Monster Cup, and the Motocross the Nations when it's here in the United States. Uh, we generally staff it with uh, two physicians, a trauma nurse, an athletic trainer, and uh, one or two of our own paramedics, and then work with the local paramedics. Uh, I'm based out of Loma Linda University Medical Center in Marietta. This was from about 10 years ago, but tonight I think we're all going to get, may get some more snow up there again. Uh, First and foremost, how do we prevent concussions? Uh, I uh, came up with this saying a long time ago, uh, and that the most important thing to do is be in shape before you ride. Don't ride to get in shape. Uh, and that's getting training and your metabolic needs, um, your cardiovascular training, uh, whether it be mountain biking or uh, road biking or stationary bike or rowing machines. We need to do strength. We'll learn a little bit later how important balance, it, balance training is and vision training. And a lot of these exercises may seem very boring to you all, uh, but they work. And it makes you a better rider, a better athlete, and at less risk for, um, for concussions. Uh, preventative equipment. And Mr. Weber is going to talk about this. Uh, there's uh, it, initially with 6D, but also there's been many, uh, several other newer modern designs of helmets. And I strongly recommend that you look at these modern designs. Um, the, I think they do make a difference. We're still collecting data on a research basis on that, but I think they make a significant difference. When, you, when you're looking at a helmet, uh, I apologize, the doorbell went off and my dog went crazy. Uh, it's, it, it makes a difference with the, uh, when you're uh, looking at helmets, look at the research that they've done uh, for their different systems. Um, finally, concussion education is mandatory for the new United States Motorcycle Coaching Association. This is an organization that's been in existence for about three years now. Every coach that goes through the certification is required to have concussion training as well as uh, first aid and CPR training. Um, so when you're looking for coaches, look for people that have had this certification and they've gotten that concussion training to help you all as you continue on in your careers. Um, how do, what happens when we get a concussion? There's a couple different ways. In motocross and at most sports, it's a direct blow. Uh, it can vary in its force, the magnitude of it, and also the direction. In moto, it can come from the top of the head, the side of the head, or what is known as a mandibular or a jawbone blow directly through your, uh, through your chin bar. Uh, what is a concussion? There's only one really important word in this whole uh, definition, and that's the word complex. It's not a single thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a complex uh, patho means a problem in the physiology um, the affecting the brain. These forces induce abnormal me uh, metabolism, rat result in a rapid onset of alteration in brain function. And that brain function can come in, a, uh, alterations can come in a couple different ways. Usually it resolves spontaneously, but we have to make sure that it resolves. Um, it's primarily the mineral pumps. The biggest one is the sodium pump, which gets disrupted. I know most of you have never seen the inside of a toilet, but you can talk to your dads. Um, there's a valve in there uh, represented by the blue here. It's called a flapper valve. When it works normally and you flush the toilet, it comes back down and stops. 
stops the water from flowing. If the water keeps running and running and running, it's a bad flapper valve. The same thing happens in the brain. In moto terms, those of you that have seen two strokes or maybe worked on them, um, it's a, the reed valves get thick and they get stiff. Uh, and so the gas and the air mixture doesn't flow into the engine and it doesn't work right. Just like one's brain when uh, their pump doesn't work correct. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cough and a cold here, I'll do my best. On the left hand side shows when you're at rest. NA means sodium. Um, and when it's inactive, the, the valve, the red valve at the bottom is closed. When you say I'm gonna scratch my head or I'm gonna twist that throttle, that valve opens up and sodium begins to throw, uh, flow in to allow your nerve impulses to work. When you have a concussion on the left-hand side here, that flapper valve gets formed and the sodium keeps flowing and flowing and flowing and then you'll have brain abnormalities. It's not until our brains heal this that we're back to our normal physiology. And that takes time. Um, and it's very difficult to predict what that time is gonna be. But it's that until that flapper valve, that valve gets back to normal, uh, uh, we need to be careful and not place ourselves at risk for re-injury. Uh, football versus moto. Every sport involves risk. Um, moto and football for males is some of the higher ones, not necessarily the highest. Um, in females, uh, moto is number three after cheerleading and girls. Who's doing it and what it is. The football helmet is designed to take multiple impacts. The number of impacts that is taken is greater, but the impact force is less. The moto helmet's designed to take a larger impact, initially designed to prevent death. The newer designs that uh, we feel are preventing a lot of other things. They are designed to be discarded after an impact, really no matter how small. Moto impacts have greater forces, but much less frequent. And again, the new technology we feel is helping with some of these other forces uh, that we may uh, were seen in the past. Uh, on the left side is helmet, the old school helmet testing. We would take a helmet and drop something on it uh, from the back, from the front to the top. Our testing has gotten much more sophisticated since then. When one of our professional athletes has an injury um, and we're evaluating them, we have them bring their helmet in with them. So we can also evaluate the helmet to look at the damage both on the outer shell and on the, uh, on the, on the inside. The, um, it is uh, very important that we do this and many of the manufacturers representatives um, uh, representatives uh, will come in and evaluate the helmet and perhaps take the helmet for further analysis. What's the number one risk factor for concussion? The Y chromosome. For those of you that haven't had biology, those are males. Uh, in moto terms, it's fourth gear uh, tapped, and so you'll try to make it over that 180-foot triple jump. Um, all professional organizations, collegiate organizations, high school organizations, and youth sports use a uh, consensus statement that was, is developed by an international conference on concussion in sport. Uh, it's held every three years. The last one was in Berlin in November of 2016. It gives very specific guidelines. They've been holding these since 2005 and things have modified significantly over the years. Uh, those of you that make it to the professional level and the FIM level, this is mandated. It's also mandated on the professional level for the AMA. If a concussion is suspected, it's very important to have immediate removal from the athletic event until that athlete is evaluated to determine is it a concussion or not. Um, and you, you can't always know right away. Uh, it's also important until that athlete is, is released to do things that they don't have any other at-risk activities. 
I've been in enough moto pits to know when the riders stop riding, they'll recover, but then the next thing they'll do, they'll get their skateboard, their scooter, and their pit bike out and ride around. Uh, those are at-risk activities. Uh, for those of you that are looking for someone that uh, is qualified and experienced in concussions in your local area, I would recommend two different organizations that can help you find a provider uh, in your area. One is the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, and that's amssm.org. Um, and they, it's a national organization um, of primary care physicians specializing in sports medicine. And 99% uh, of those will specialize in concussions as well. The impact test is the neurocognitive test that's used na nationally and internationally. They also have on their website they have a section called find a provider where you can enter your zip code and find a provider that's close and convenient for you. And finally, that's my email there again. And do not hesitate to email me and I can assist you in finding someone close by. Um, what are symptoms of concussion? There's a whole list here and um, not every concussion is gonna have this whole list. If one has a concussion two years ago and has another one this year, uh, you may not have the same symptoms. And so the statement that, well, it doesn't feel like the last one I had is really more normal than abnormal. Uh, but things such as headaches, confusion, dizziness, feeling like you're walking in a fog, slow down, fatigue, visual disturbances, me either having trouble seeing, having trouble focusing, uh, being sensitive to both lights and noises, memory dysfunction. Uh, do you remember what, how it happened? Do you remember what, what you had for lunch? Do you remember um, uh, anything on this side? One thing I do when, uh, is when a rider comes in, I always point to the lady sitting in the corner and say, do you know who that is? If they don't say mom, that's a problem. Uh, and then finally, balance dysfunction. We have the athlete stand up. Uh, to, can they stand on two legs, one leg, one leg in front of each other. Based on these, we don't know how quick it's going to take to recover from a concussion. Dizziness is a poor sign for quick recovery. However, if uh, one is nauseated, meaning an upset stomach, if you vomited or you're having any kind of small or large seizures, those are signs of more significant head trauma and you need to be taken to the hospital for, uh, to, for further evaluation. We do a history, we find out how many concussions, we've had other injuries, if there are other medical problems in the athletes, our physical exam. But the deficits can be cognitive, that's how your brain works, ocular, how your eyes work, vestibular, how balance works, cervical, are you having headaches, particularly in the back of your head, and auditory. Are you having trouble hearing or are, annoyed, are you being hypersensitive, meaning even the smallest noise really bothers you? Uh, first and foremost, you cannot diagnose a concussion on TV. Uh, I think you've all been around Moto enough to know that uh, you, there can be some spectacular get-offs uh, and everybody's fine. There can be some what appear to be minor get-offs and they have some We'll do our exam both at rest. If we have any question, we'll do a, uh, <coughs> we'll get their heart rate up. We'll do a, um, a handwritten test on site to help confirm our diagnosis. We don't always do that test uh, because if there's no question about our diagnosis from our history and physical, uh, we don't wanna make things worse. Um, what are the risks of, after you've had a concussion of continuing? One, as a physician, uh, a track physician, it, it's my role to make sure when I return an athlete to ride, they're at no greater risk for injuring themselves or just as important for injuring someone else at that same time uh, while they're on the track. So if you disturb your balance, your vision, and your reaction time, until those resolve, you're placing not only yourself, but others at significant risk on the track. It's a, there's a rare situation called a second impact syndrome. 
where if you get a second concussion sooner than before you're recovered, it can be a catastrophic brain injury. It's rare. I've seen one in my career. I don't want to see another. Um, plus, returning to ride, returning to play prior to resolution of everything can actually keep you out longer rather than shorter. Um, if you lose consciousness, meaning if you're knocked out, um, it, you have a concussion, but you don't have to be knocked out to have a concussion. Um, the more times than not, you don't see anything on standard CT or MRI scans. Those are specialized scans. Most concussions resolve over seven to 14 days. However, because I'm looking at the faces of our audience here, if you're an adolescent uh, or pre-adolescent, you tend to have prolonged recovery times. Why? Because your brain is still growing like the rest of you. And so we have to be very careful for, for that age group. Um, Moto has helped out by limiting our displacements when we race. Uh, hockey and soccer have also changed their rules for the youth athlete as well. Uh, again, second concussion can cause prolonged symptoms, rarely but occasionally permanent damage. And sometimes concussions can last a long time, and we can't predict that on the day of injury. Uh, we have to follow that along. Uh, we don't grade concussions anymore. If dad says, well, I had one and it was a grade two, well, we don't do that anymore because we it was it's been shown that it doesn't help. It doesn't help determine how severe it is, how quick that one's going to recover, the risk of future concussions, or the risk of any uh, further symptoms. So we don't use it anymore, even though we ask frequently on what grade uh, of concussion does my uh, rider, does my son have. Um, MRs and CTs is helpful if there are uh, signs of further, further injury. And if there are, you should be evaluated in the emergency room. Uh, there's a research MRI scan that may be coming out that may be more helpful looking at neuroinflammation. And there's extensive research looking for a blood test. Now, I don't know any writer that likes needle sticks, but if a blood test can help us, uh, we'll take it. Um, this is a CT scan. Homer on the right-hand side here has a problem, but I don't think it's a concussion problem. Um, we tried these dogs like the, uh, looking for everything else. That didn't work either. Um, about a year ago, uh, this came out in all the major newspapers and news outlets that we now had a blood test for concussion. Uh, and it was premature. There is a blood test developed by the Banner Institute in, in Phoenix, ironically by a Dr. Ryman, uh, no relation. Uh, it's a blood test to help determine, do you need a CT scan? The problem is it costs $400 and takes four hours to do. And if there's signs of something beyond a concussion, that CT scan should be done well before four hours. There is another one that should be coming out in about a year from now that will help determine recovery from concussion. Uh, developed by the, general, uh, the uh, people at, in Philadelphia. How do we rehabilitate if you have one? Physical and mental rest. We don't put people in cocoons anymore, uh, but we do have your rest. We don't let you go out and exercise. We certainly don't let you back on the bike. Mental rest. In adolescents and kids, what is that? You drop down the visual and audit, auditory stimuli. That's a fancy way of saying no video games, no loud noises, no bright lights, no fireworks, no flashbang movies. You can watch movies with your mother. Uh, the, uh, and as well, for those of you in school, you may need some short-term modif modification of the score. We rehabilitate that balance and that visual uh, components of it. And then we do a gradual return to ride program, first in a gym before you're uh, at a track and it's not go, um, go right back to the track and ride like a banshee. We gradually increase what you do. This is what our pros do. We require them all to have a baseline neurocognitive test. They are not allowed to race until they're evaluated and if a concussion is confirmed until the protocol is completed. We make them go to a physician who knows what they're doing in concussion management 
We make them take a post-injury neurocognitive test, and then it's a five-day return to ride program. This is a very aggressive program. Uh, and then the, finally, the rider must present an argument for final clearance on race day. Um, our clearance difficulties are primarily the athletes leave our venue. I'm covering the race in Detroit this weekend. Uh, and they'll fly back to California, back to Florida, back to Texas. We need to find them a concussion expert in that area. I also understand the competitive and investment issues here. However, it's more, uh, you'll have a longer career if you let the injury heal and you're back going full go rather than having deficiencies in your ocular or your balance uh, components. And our goal is to get you returned to ride as quick as we can, but safely. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea and Tasha to introduce Mr. Weber, and we should have time for questions at the end. Okay, wonderful, Dr. Ryan. I hope you feel better. I know it's not fun when you have a cough and a cold, but you did an awesome job. Of course, we knew you would. We're excited because um, we have uh, some of our students at training facilities and they've got it on on a big TV. And so um, there's, there's uh, GPF and Club MX watching with us today. So that's fantastic. And now I'd like to introduce Bob at the end of both presentations, of course, as always, we'll have a q and A. I know Bob Weber for many years, um, probably 35 years, right, Bob? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, about about that. Something like that. We were only 10, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right on. Uh, so take it away, Bob. Well, uh, Andy, thank you and uh, welcome uh, everybody. Thanks for uh, letting me make a presentation about uh, helmets and 60 to your group. I think it's an outstanding uh, program that you have there and I just really appreciate being asked um, to join. A um, little bit, uh, I'll start with, uh, Tasha, you've got my thing up, right? Okay, perfect. So um, on the screen right now is, is the first slide. Basically, it's just a little bit about our, our company. We're dedicated to, uh, you know, the pursuit of brain protection, and, and that's where our company started. A uh, little backstory on myself. Um, I, I've been racing for over 40 years. Um, graduated all the way up to the expert uh, division, raced most of my career back in New England, but uh, rode some nationals and such, went to Florida a few years, and uh, it's just been a part of my life uh, throughout my whole life, and I think that it's such a fantastic sport uh, in developing personal character, strength, competition, just, just all the good attributes that come with uh, being a motocross racer, so uh, I've been involved in the sport for a long time. I, I think I'd like to maybe share one little story right out of the gate here. Um, I've had a few concussions over my career and uh, Andy's husband, Don, was actually with me and about nine other guys on uh, a morning 22, 23 years ago, right before my second daughter was born. And uh, I crashed on my mountain bike really hard and I was out for nearly 10 minutes and I woke up and there was an ambulance, a cop car and three fire trucks and about a hundred people uh, staring at me, wondering if I was going to, uh, you know, make it or not. And that was, that was a pretty scary uh, concussion that day. I ended up in the hospital overnight and uh, with vomiting and a separated shoulder and, you know, severe concussion. So uh, I've been there and, and, and Dr. Ryman's excellent overview on concussions and, and brain injury should be uh, really paid attention to. Uh, you definitely do not want to have a second concussion in a short term after a first. Uh, that second impact syndrome that he re referenced is a, a true and dangerous thing. So you obviously and, and very importantly need to give yourself a chance to heal. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of 60 Helmets. Uh, we've been in business now for, uh, since 2011, we're about eight years into our project. Uh, we took two years, uh, my partner and I, Robert Reisinger, uh, we took two years developing the concept of our omnidirectional suspension technology uh, as we developed it and tested it to put it into a helmet. Um, Little little uh, further history on the company um, from the concussions I've suffered myself 
And my, uh, I've been in the business of uh, the motorcycle business my entire professional career. Uh, and um, I just had some awareness of what helmets were not doing in the benefit of the athlete in an accident. And I thought that we could improve on that by applying science and engineering uh, against the problem of uh, how do we reduce energy and, and mitigate that energy transfer to the brain in an accident. And, and, and helmets weren't doing that at the time as effective as they need to. Um, so let's see, let's go to the next slide there. Um, uh, Tasha, I think uh, that's the end, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so I wanted to add a couple of uh, statistics that you guys might um, be aware of. Tasha, did you get Derek's new um, revised version of this? You know what? It, it's no big deal. There's just a couple of uh, uh, edits in here. I wanted to yeah, go back to the prior page, please. Now backwards. Uh, go back to the. Um, okay, so. Um, Basically, I wanted to mention a couple of statistics that um, are out there. And um, there's over a million Americans each year sustain a concussion. 300,000 of those are sports related. That's a huge number. Um, motocross is number four on the list, so it's pretty high up there. Skateboarding, which I'm sure many of you participate in, uh, is number one. Snowboarding, skiing, and then motocross. So, um, you know, we're definitely in a riskier sport than, uh, say, tennis or basketball for, for head injury. But, um, you know, it's certainly a, a very real and serious issue. Um, the incidents is, is potentially very high and um, we want to be uh, really certain that we, we take good care of that. So um, if you can, if you got me back up there, Tasha. Can I share my screen? Tasha, can you unmute for a second? Hold on. Yeah, I got it. Sorry, I was having some difficulties there. Okay. And do you have Derek's updated one? I do. Okay. I have it up now. Sorry about okay. that. Uh, no worries. I just, I kind of have it up on the side over here too, but. Uh, okay. Uh, either way. Okay. No, let's use yours if you got it. it Okay. Got it. Okay. All right, cool. So if we can maybe wheelie down to the fourth one, that's me, guys, and me and my dirt bike, some of the statistics. Okay, so um, this is a good place. Um, many of you may be aware we made as much noise about it as we could, but this is a pretty important slide uh, in the history of our company and uh, really some uh, uh, very high level um, accreditation for um, our technology. We submitted for this NFL um, challenge, which was an engineering uh, a call to action to develop a safer, uh, a better energy management material to go into uh, helmets in a multi-impact environment. Mm -hmm. And we were one of 125 companies that submitted uh, for this grant money. And uh, the goal was to uh, choose five individual uh, engineering companies or, or companies that applied to grant $250,000. And with that $250,000, we got one year to further develop our materials inside the uh, NFL program. And at the end of that year, each of the five companies that were uh, awarded the original grant money would be judged on the 
um, development and improvement of our material. And ultimately one of us would be um, selected as the winner of the program. And that was another half a million dollar award. So this was a really cool deal. We were one of the five. Um, we started working on some multi-impact materials within uh, the Head Health Challenge. Uh, through the course of a year, we uh, made a lot of progress with our technology and we really improved how the system was working in the benefit of rotational acceleration. So basically uncoupling the outer shell of the helmet from the inside liner of the helmet. And by doing that, we allow the uh, shell and the outer surface of the helmet to displace upon an impact in relation to the inside of the helmet, which might want to travel in the direction it's already going. And by doing that, we can scrub off um, some of this rotational acceleration that comes along with the in injury or with the impact. And it's this rotational acceleration that the medical community has proven is the root of a concussive impact. So this, this rapid rotation or spin basically um, causes the skull to rotate faster than the brain can catch up because the brain is suspended in cerebral fluid and there's some t there's tearing and shearing that goes on with these rotational in in uh, rotational impacts so we want to reduce that jerk if you will of how fast the head has to rotate with the helmet in an impact um, Ultimately, with the Head Health Challenge and, and winning this program, we made some uh, significant improvements in our early design of uncoupling the two liners. So maybe we go to the next uh, slide here, Tasha. Um, so this, this came out of our presentation a year ago when we introduced the ATR2 to the marketplace. Uh, we talked about raising the bar and improving the uh, level of protection that the ATR2 has versus the ATR1 and versus the other helmets in the marketplace. Um, our mission statement, um, you know, right out of our uh, business plan is to provide the public with the superior safety helmets from both a technological perspective and a design perspective. And then to continue to uh, challenge our company to improve its technology and lead the marketplace with innovative solutions. So that's what we live by and sleep by here at 6D is we're always pushing ourselves to improve the product and um, improve the ability of the technology, the omnidirectional suspension technology that's in the helmet to do its work on the benefit of uh, our customers and the athletes out there. So uh, next slide, please. One way you might want to look at omnidirectional suspension is um, really a helmet within a helmet. And if you, uh, it, those of you, hopefully we've got some 60 uh, riders out there in the audience today um, that are already familiar with our product, but if you dive into the helmet and explore it, uh, what we've got there is an uh, expanded or exploded uh, view of the helmet from some engineering files. But you basically see that inside EPS liner that is attached to a carrier that is attached to some dampers, which is further attached to the outer um, uh, EPP liner in the helmet and then ultimately the shell. And that inside helmet there has the ability to displace in three dimensions. So upon an impact, it's able to compress like suspension, but also rotate with the, with the uh, damper system that we have in there. And, and that uh, goes to support the reduction of that rotational acceleration uh, that I talked about a moment ago. Um, the ATR2, we also designed to be rebuildable. Uh, the EPP outer uh, liner is a multi-impact material, and that came out of the work uh, that we did inside the NFL Head Health Challenge, because for football, as Dr. Ryman indicated, the helmet has to be there for multiple impacts. Every play of the game, that helmet has to be just like it was the play before, so it can manage the impacts of the players coming together. Obviously, they can't change a helmet every play of the game. In the cycling community and the motorcycling community, the helmets are designed to manage a single uh, impact from a, a much higher uh, potential impact uh, below or, or, or force. And because of that, they need to be manufactured out of different materials, and that's why they're exhausted or used up, if you will, in a, in a moderate to severe 
uh, crash, the EPS foam, uh, that inside liner in our case, and in most other helmet designs, not everyone, but in most other designs where the, e the uh, inner liner is made of EPS 100%, um, that, that EPS is damaged and is not going to function in its same capacity after a moderate to severe impact. So that's where you need to examine the helmet, determine if it's been compromised, and replace the helmet uh, if it has been. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is um, a cutaway. Uh, you guys may be aware that we just uh, last month introduced the youth version of our ATR2 motocross helmet. And this is a cutaway uh, view uh, of, of some engineering drawings of the uh, ATR2 youth helmet. Um, if you guys are familiar with the ATR1, the original youth helmet, we cut some corners on the liner installation, the trims on the helmet uh, to try to get some of the cost out of it, but maintained every bit of the same technology that was in the adult helmet in the youth one to provide that benefit of rotational acceleration, low energy compliance that the, that the helmet's known for. Um, so with the ATR2 youth, we um, went ahead and we invested in the trims and the liners, and it is effectively an exact uh, replica of the adult ATR2 uh, helmet. So it's re rebuildable just like the ad adult helmet is. As long as the shell's not damaged in a crash, then we can uh, take that inside EPS out install a new one, put the helmet back together, make sure everything's good and ship it back to you and you're back in business. So uh, it's a, that's a value proposition over time because you should get more life out of your helmet than potentially another helmet that does not uh, give you that capability. Um, what we're looking at here, if you look at the, uh, that inner surface or the outer surface of the inside liner, that effectively has a um, polycarbonate shell encapsulating the EPS, and that does a number of things. It gives strength to the inside um, surface of the helmet so that it doesn't uh, crack or displace and uh, tear in tension and stretching uh, loads as easily, and so does that, that uh, carrier that you see around the perimeter of that uh, shell does the same thing. But then it also reduces friction so that it can slide easily against those yellow, or excuse me, the orange caps that you see uh, in the design here. So uh, with the new helmet, the ATR2s, both youth and adult, we increase the um, suspension travel of that inside liner from seven millimeters to 10. Uh, so a 30% increase in uh, traction and travel before the two layers bind together. And then even at that point, that out Outside EPP liner continues to compress, and if necessary, the EPS liner on the inside uh, compresses also to give the athlete the longest and slowest ride down to a stop as possible. Because when you think about it, that's what you want to do. You're coming to a stop in the accident, um, and you want to do that over as much time and distance as possible. Um, so a, a very small volume helmet with high density EPS, because it has to be to pass the standards, you're gonna stop a lot quicker and that's bad for the brain, okay? That, that comes back to that uh, jerk that I spoke of earlier, uh, the change in acceleration. You're traveling at one speed, the helmet has an impact, now you're deflected and traveling at another speed. That change of velocity is what I'm talking about when I mention jerk and you wanna make that as simple and easy as possible. Um, Okay, next slide piece, please. Um, what's different and why is it important? I think I've covered most of this stuff about the particular uh, helmet. We did add some other safety features to it. There's uh, the back of the neck, the shell is uh, cut up and covered with some suspension uh, materials down there that allows it to be more forgiving if it is forced down into the back of the cervical spine. Um, that EPP sternum pad it, it is, is, uh, uh, protrudes out below the bottom of the chin bar and that if you smack your uh, chin on the crossbar or you know on the gas tank or whatever you get really out of control of the ground whatever you've got some additional uh, foam protection there and then we're using thicker EPP foam in the cheek pad so um, we get more suspension and more give out of that as well so we're basically trying to uh, wrap your head in the softest uh, cavity possible 
but also to make sure that we're meeting the high demands and the high energy requirements over uh, that the standards require us to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I know I'm running through this fast and I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end, but uh, there's two different types of acceleration that we talk about with energy when we're testing helmets. The first is linear, which is the traditional testing that helmets have always gone through. Um, but all of the certification requirements, be it Snell or DOT or ECE or the Australian standard, all of those are set at a, um, uh, a high maximum velocity and then a set uh, transfer of G's, usually around 250, depending on the standards, that cannot be transferred in greater uh, amounts to the, to the head form or the helmet will fail. And everything's pass fail at the high velocity impact. Nobody before 6D came around was looking at the lower velocity impacts, the three meter per second, the four meter per second, the five meter per second uh, impacts. And what that means is, you're not, this isn't the, the speed of your motorcycle or of your forward travel in an accident. This is the speed at which your helmet is traveling with an impact something. And you could have a simple tip over, but because your head is rotating around your shoulder as you hit the ground, the head form is, is accelerated and it might be a higher velocity uh, impact than just you know, the, the rate you were traveling on your motorcycle when you had the crash. So this graph here re reflects a three meter per second impact on the front of the helmet on an incline anvil. So what we're doing here is we're measuring the linear acceleration and also the rotational acceleration at the same time. But you can see the 6D helmet, which is the youth helmet, uh, which is represented by the green line in this particular impact is not even exceeding the 30G mark, um, where the other three helmets, uh, and they were uh, competitive youth helmets uh, in this graph, were all at 50Gs, uh, maybe as much as 58, uh, on the same impact. So, you know, basically nearly double the energy was transferred to the head form. Well, why is that important? Because the onset of a concussion in an adult male is 60 Gs and a youth rider or a female rider, that number is even lower. So you could, this particular impact, just three meters per second could be a concussion in certain individuals. We're not even close with the impact in the 6D. You're getting back on your bike and you're continuing to ride. Um, next slide, please. 6D also, I think we're responsible for coining the, the, uh, the phrase low threshold energy because like I said before, nobody was looking at uh, energy transfers below the certification standards at the high velocities. Um, so rotational acceleration is just exactly what I spoke of earlier about this shearing and tearing and the, the, the spinning of the brain uh, in an impact. And this is uh, caused by the oblique strike or the off angle strike up to the surface of the helmet. Uh, basically any impact that's not going through directly through the center of mass of the head is going to uh, be an oblique strike at some angle and obviously some greater than others. And this uh, insights this spin. So this is the, uh, the same type of an impact. We're measuring rotational acceleration or angular acceleration with this graph. It's at four meters per second, so it's a little further up the scale, also on the front of the helmet, also on the incline. And you can see that the 6D helmet was what, maybe out there at uh, 15, 12, 14 milliseconds, something like that. Uh, we're close to a thousand kilorads per second squared, um, where the competitive helmets at a much shorter time duration, uh, the five, six, seven, eight mil, uh, millisecond, they're hitting their peak rotational acceleration and it's nearly uh, double, okay? Uh, certainly two thirds plus on the orange and the, and the red lines there. So um, if you take this further up the scale on a higher energy impact, anything above about 3000, is uh, grounds for a severe uh, concussion and potential brain injury uh, beyond a concussion. And we've seen slides uh, comparing our helmet against some traditional designs 
where the traditional helmet with no technology was up in the uh, 18 to 20,000 uh, kilorads and you know significantly higher. Uh, now our velocity goes up at the same time or our rotational acceleration goes up at the same time as the uh, impact velocity goes up, but we still say well below the competitive helmets in these uh, studies uh, in uh, the laboratory. Okay, so next slide, please. One of the things we talk about with 6D from the very beginning was we provide a broader range of protection for the helmet or for the athlete um, over uh, the course of different types of accidents, okay? So the, the omnidirectional suspension technology allows the helmet to be functioning and working when a traditional helmet design is not doing anything to mitigate that transfer and absorb the energy. And this has to do with foam densities and, and construction of the helmet and, and how the helmets fit on the head and all of that comes into play. But basically what this graph is showing us is anything above the 60 G line, which is on the on the left side of the, uh, of the graph here under linear acceleration. So we're talking linear acceleration again here at three, four, five, and seven and a half meters per second. And if you take the 60 and go across you can go all the way to five meters per second and we're still not over 60 G's, but the, and this is our youth helmet again against uh, those other two youth helmets. Um, but then if you're looking at the competitors, uh, particularly the orange and the red, um, you're at 100 G's, you're over 100 G's at five meters per second, more than twice as much energy being transferred to the head form than on, this, on the 60. And then if you just take it out to the right at seven and a half meters per second, we maintain a significant advantage in mitigating that energy transfer. So um, this gets very complex and um, what I would encourage each of you to do when you're looking at your helmet purchases, uh, I would encourage you to do your homework and get educated on the different types of technologies. Uh, the MIPS liner, which has been in the marketplace um, uh, probably since about 2015, maybe 14, uh, about a year after 60 came to the marketplace, the MIPS technology was available out there as a licensable product. Um, one ski helmet was using a MIPS liner when we announced our technology to the world in November of 2012. And by 2014, uh, some of the other competitive motocross companies uh, looking for a solution for rotational acceleration uh, went and were able to license the, the MIPS technology. It did not require any, re any significant re-engineering to the helmet to put this uh, MIPS technology in the helmet. And then uh, it gave you some benefits uh, uh, in defense of rotational acceleration, but it could do nothing for low energy or linear acceleration. And in fact, at certain uh, greater impact angles uh, closer through the center of mass of the brain, like a 90 degree impact, it can't do anything. It's just in the helmet uh, taking up space at that, at, that, at that stage of the game. And it doesn't really take up much space, but it's not effectively doing the work it's designed to in an impact like that. So I would encourage each of you to um, ask questions at the dealership, uh, go to the company website, pay attention to uh, what the helmet is designed to do and why, and then you can uh, make a better purchase decision when it's time to uh, choose a helmet. After all, the reason we're uh, wearing helmets is for safety, and that is uh, the number one most important reason why uh, you want to select a good helmet. You don't want to be uh, second guessing, uh, should I have done something different to protect myself differently? Um, you know, because you only have one brain and it, and it doesn't heal very well as Dr. Ryman indicated. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think that wraps it up for me. That's, uh, we're dedicated to, to brain protection and, and the HDR2 and our omnidirectional uh, suspension technology uh, delivers just that. Awesome, Bob. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And I just want to point out to all of our, our school community, here we have two motorcycle riders. One became a doctor and one became an engineer of an amazing product that can really 
keep your head safe. So there's always plan B in an education, right? Or is that really plan A? Okay, um, I'll let Tasha read the chat and see who we can call on for some Q and A, because that's that's where we really get to see these little faces shine when they ask you. I'm not private. Oops. Uh oh, uh -oh. Tanner, Tanner, I hey, hear Tanner. you. Tanner. <laughs> I guess Tanner's first. Go on, Tanner. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ryman fixed my heel. Nice. And, and I hear you're going like gangbusters, Tanner. That's what your dad <laughs> says. <laughs> and uh, my mom is happy that she didn't have to see you because that means that nobody has gotten hurt. <laughs> That's the way to be. We want everybody out there being safe. Um, and I want a, I want a 60 helmet. My dad makes me rebel. Tell your dad will have to chat sometime. <laughs> Tanner. I know. My dad says you have to rebel because they pay the bills. <laughs> I can hear your dad saying. I don't understand saying. how that works. Okay. Life gets complicated. Life does get complicated at times. Oh, man. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Tanner, for sharing. Tasha's asking if you have a question and you type it in the chat box, then she'll know to call on you and then you can unmute. Okay. It looks like uh, Laura and Ronan have a question. So you guys can unmute and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Ryman and, and uh, Bob, thanks so much for all that great information. I had a question for Dr. Ryman concerning his theories or thoughts or opinions on mouth guards and uh, if they do indeed help uh, with, you know, lessening concussion or aiding in even preventing some of it. Uh, yes, they do for certain types. Uh, in moto, it would be hitting your chin bar uh, on the on the handlebar where the blow comes up through the the mandible that's about 20 percent of concussions uh, so it certainly will help that blows to the head in other areas it's probably not going to help and there's a wide variety of designs on mouth guards uh, a lot of people think they can't breathe with a mouth guard but there's a tremendous amount of des good designs out there for multiple sports where you, you can uh, breathe heavy without it affecting your, uh, uh, how, how you're riding and still provide that protection. I do recommend it. Okay, we were thinking of getting one specially made and designed by his dentist, like kind of like the Invis Invisalign, it looks like that. Um, I guess if anything, just to protect his beautiful smile. <laughs> yes, yes, no, it's, it's very worthwhile. A custom fit is gonna be, uh, is going to be more tolerable for the athlete than just uh, uh, the one you put in the pot in the, on your stove at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, let your dentist know what he wants to do with it. Okay. And, uh, he should have a wide variety of types that he could prescribe. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, Price, does that answer your question too? I know Price had a question about what mouth guard you would recommend, Dr. Ryman. Well, there's multi, a multitude of brands. Some of the writers will wear ones that are designed for boxing uh, because they, uh, they allow you to breathe a little bit better than, say, a football, um, uh, a football mouth guard where, you know, they'll exert for 10 seconds and then they'll, they'll get a couple minutes off before they go to the next play. Great question. Hey. I love the mouth guard questions. Anybody else? I realized that was like a physics lesson, but it's really a lot of development that has to go in, in there. Even I was following that conversation and physics is kind of challenging. <laughs> <clears throat> I think that uh, talking about having that second concussion, Dr. Ryman, is so important because I can tell you that when Michael um, was over in Europe, 
he had a concussion, you know, and there he is traveling 19 years old in a different country. And he did have a second concussion two months later. And we did have to, you know, see a specialist and really just not ride for about six months. And so um, <clears throat> that's, that's very scary. So it is so important to take the time off and not just think, you know, you're fine unless you're evaluated. Um, Price had another question. Andrea Price, do you want to go ahead and ask, ask your question? Oh, we can't unmute. Okay. Price asks, uh, what about for BMX riders? Do you recommend full face helmets or BMX certified? Um, a full face helmet is going to give you more protection than the, the BMX certified, minimally the BMX certified, but a full face helmet will do better. It depends what you're doing on the BMX bike, whether you're racing or doing freestyle or doing the X Games 200 foot ramp. Um, the, the higher level, I think uh, you would want to uh, wear a full face. The, and cer certainly with freestyle. Uh, I, I see your follow-up question there. Uh, one of our athletic trainers that has worked with us for years uh, is a fo uh, ah! former ah! And, st and, and still a high-level BMX rider. Uh, he wears a full face helmet. Okay. Good question, guys. Um, any, any other questions? Before we get into any more questions, um, on track students, if you haven't already put in the chat log your full name, please make sure you do that before we end um, the presentation. But if you do have any questions, please go ahead and um, put them in there. Okay, we got Todd. Uh, you wanna go ahead and unmute and ask your question, please? Sure, I just wanted to be clear on what the new procedure is with the AITR2. Um, if you do take an impact. Um, before, we would send you the ones and you would evaluate them and either tell us it's no good and or that it's okay and send it back. So now with the new twos, what do we do? Yeah, really the, the process is the same, Todd. Um, we do need to do that work here um, because it's, uh, it's technical in nature of changing out that liner and we can't leave that to the consumer to do. But um, basically uh, could do many of the same things. A lot of helmets will ins inspect either by video chat or photographs when in just communicating with the customer today. And you know, if we can see that the shell's damaged, you know, it's like, okay, well, unfortunately that one needs to go on the shelf and start over again. But in in most cases, the shell's good and it's got some scratches and whatever, but you know, the integrity of the shell is fine. And then we just gotta get it in here. And the cool thing with the ATR2 is it takes us about 15 to 20 minutes, you know, where the, the ATR1 was really kind of remanufacturing the helmet and it was about an hour to do it and uh, it, was, it was complex and, you know, you could, if you didn't do it properly, you could damage parts, right? So the ATR2 is a piece of cake. It was engineered to be that way and it's just a, it's just a better mousetrap in that regard also. All right, thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, hi, Mr. Tom there. Uh, nice to have you on with us. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Oh, you're on mute, Tom. Oh, no, he's not on mute. We can't hear you. <coughs> no. It's nice to see you on here, though. Thanks for joining oh. us today. No, can't hear you now. <coughs> it does not show that you did, though. But we can uh, go ahead. Oh, there he is. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Good to see you. Um, nice. Dr. Ryman, thank you for all of your hard work. Bob, um, we've been associated with, the, with each other for quite some time. Yep. Appreciate all the hard work. Um, you can, my question kind of revolved around something that we've had a discussion about in the past, which is snowboarding, skiing, all the stuff that all these kids tend to do, um, and hopefully getting them to wear helmets for, for that purpose and, and perhaps 60s involvement in that going forward. 
Uh, yeah, no, actually, uh, you know, Tom's a, a, a huge advocate and he wears his mountain bike helmet on the ski slopes and uh, we have other customers that do the same thing. So, um, you know, from the safety perspective, the, uh, the our, our mountain bike helmet is good as a skate helmet. It's good as a, as a ski helmet. It can, you know, be utilized for some other activities, but the feature and creature comforts might not be ideal for that activity. And that's where helmets get so specialized. Um, but between the different uh, categories of, of activities, you know. So um, we have opportunities that we're looking at, I should say, you know, they're uh, in some other markets and, and some things that, you know, the company's uh, goal is to grow into those segments as we move ahead. But, you know, those things take time and, and, uh, and money and, and, and all of that, and, and they strategically need to make sense. So um, I think the really neat thing for our company is the omnidirectional suspension technology is a really, really good solution uh, that does what it's designed to do and uh, in changing the, the dynamics of energy exchange and an impact. And so, you know, as our job is to get that into more helmet applications over time uh, as we can, because that's just good for the market, you know. Um, and yeah, so maybe that doesn't completely answer the question, but uh, we definitely want to be there. It's just mm -hmm. some things take time. Yep, absolutely. As always, thanks everybody for, for all the hard work. Dr. Ryman, I'll see you this weekend. And uh, Bob, uh, uh, as always, uh, awesome job. And it's, and it's great to, uh, to have somebody out there looking out for the athletes, uh, even us old athletes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Thanks, so guys. you just proved that, you know, your lifelong learner, that's what we're raising here at OnTrack School, our lifelong learners. So we're glad that you could come on here and learn with us. Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate that you a bet. great deal. Okay, guys, take care. Thanks. Okay. All right, guys. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Because if not, I'm going to go ahead and open a poll up. Um, for you guys so we can exit the uh, webinar. But before we do exit, I do want to say thank you to Bob and Paul for your time and information and, and giving us the, the wonderful knowledge of concussions and how to protect our heads and all of that kind of great stuff. So thank you guys so much. Likewise, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Tasha and Andrea. You bet, thank you. All right, guys, so on track students, if you guys can just answer these questions for us real quick, then um, you are free to go. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob.